To some embedded stuff and firmware hacking and things of this such. Now, one of the things I want to get into today is something called uh, USB multi boot. And it is a chunk of software that allows you to install or run a Windows XP environment from a USB thumb drive. Now, let's get into a little bit of reasoning why we would even want to do this. Now, yes, there are Linux distributions that will run from a live CD or a live USB thumb drive. And uh, there are Linux distributions that will even install from a USB thumb drive to a hard drive. But you know what? I'm not a Linux fanboy. I believe in the right tool for the right job. Sometimes you need Windows. For some of the stuff that I do, Windows is absolutely required. Now, I mean, it's a sad state of things, but some of us just use Windows. Now, I'm a fan of Windows XP. Uh, we've talked about Enlight in the past, uh, customizing uh, your uh, Windows XP install. And we've talked about things like uh, the BART preboot environment, or preboot environment in general, making a live Windows environment so you can do recovery or uh, whatever. Uh, some of the uh, pre-built environments already are BART PE, uh, Hiren's Boot CD, and the Ultimate Boot CD for Windows. All of these typically run from an optical drive. That's great and fine and dandy. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens if your device doesn't have an optical drive? All it has is USB. Well, until recently, until currently, you pretty much had one of two choices. You actually go and got yourself a USB optical drive enclosure kit, which as you can see, mine is not in the best of conditions. Or you got one of these all-in-one USB adapters that plugs to the back of the optical drive here and you got an external power supply. You know what? These things are kind of fidgety. So, uh, some machines won't even recognize these. This is just too bulky to carry with you everywhere. USB thumb drive, on the other hand, this is a generic $25, 4 gigabyte Memorex USB thumb drive. There's nothing special about it whatsoever. Now, um, you might be asking, well, you know, what the hell doesn't have a, uh, an optical drive these days? Well, maybe you have a so tiny ITX machine. You know, this was actually a, a, cell, a cell site, sorry, a cell phone store kiosk computer at some point. No optical drive, currently. Now, yes, there's an IDE bus. I could put an optical drive in, but do you have one? No, yeah, yeah. I got a bunch of these laying around. Got a bunch of USB thumb drives. Uh, I've even got uh, an embedded tablet here. Yeah, thing's great. Sorry, no optical drive, but it does boot from USB. Uh, give me a second. There we go. Uh, yeah, Microsoft Web TV 2. Granted, it's going to take quite a bit of low-level hacking to actually get this to boot anything besides Windows CE. Another prime example of uh, being able to load your operating system, either Windows XP or Windows Server 2000, Windows 2000, Windows NT 5.1. Anyway, point being is, um, with USB multiboot, we are able to either run a live Windows XP or Windows NT uh, environment or install it from USB. Now, there are some catch-22s. Uh, you need to know a bit about how your host, your actual hardware... Oh, yeah, I've also got the Triple E going to be installing Windows XP on that son of a bitch because Xandros sucks. Okay, so you need to know a little bit about how your hardware is going to interact with your USB. Does it read the uh, USB thumb drive as a physical hard drive, as a serial ATA or parallel ATA hard drive, or does it read it as an actual thumb drive, or does it read it as an actual USB device? That's going to be something important that you need to know. You also have to make sure that your device will allow you to boot from a USB stick. Now, uh, we're going to go to the computer side, and I will do some how-to tutorial on USB multi-boot. We'll go through a really quick install. <laughs> quick install. I'll give you a quick rundown of the software so you can actually get started with this son of a bitch. 
Okay, of course, we need to go and get a copy of USB multi-boot. Multi uh, you can go ahead and Google USB multi-boot. They're up to version 10 as of this segment. And it will lead you to www.msfn.org. There's a lot of information on this website on USB multi-boot in general, how to use it, tips, tricks, tools, techniques, etc. Once you go ahead and download it, extract it to wherever the hell you want. Um, you'll actually notice that there's a USB multi-boot dot cmd which will be running in a moment so we're going to go ahead to uh, my computer and i've already inserted my windows xp cd and we're going to plug in the usb thumb drive got to make sure that windows will detect it and we need to know the drive letter it is issued as f and i've got windows xp and i just dragged and dropped it to my uh my computer so we're here we have it. Windows XP, Service Patch 2 with Serial ATA. I did a little bit of end lighting and slipstreaming. I even made a triple E version. Now, if you notice that USB multiboot is actually a command prompt, meaning it really doesn't like very long path names, as you may notice up here. So whenever you're actually working with the actual source distribution, uh, go ahead and put it on your C drive. If you notice, I've actually got a copy of and no spaces, okay? Try not to leave the path name extremely excessively long. It doesn't like that. Here's a copy of the triple E version. All right, so go ahead, load up the USB multiboot command. And it's going to give you a quick rundown of what USB multiboot is all about, where you can get help, and etc. Press any key to continue. OK, the first thing we need to do um, is to actually format, well, if you choose to, format and prepare the actual USB drive. Now, if you use the letter P to use PE to USB, it is limited to a FAT file system, which has a maximum of a 2 gigabyte file size, or sorry, partition limit, which means no drives above 2 gigs. I haven't had much luck with that. I'm using a 4 gig, so that's out of my option. You can use the HP USB disk storage format tool, which I've had more luck with, or if you have already formatted it to whatever the hell format you want, and you do not want to destroy all data on the drive, you can hit N. So my choice is going to use H. Now here is the HP USB disk storage format tool. Now it automatically detects my, my thumb drive. Now if you format this as FAT or FAT32, again, you will be limited to 2 gigabytes. Uh, we will do a quick format. If you use FAT or FAT32, you have the option to create a DOS boot disk or startup disk, which sometimes you don't need to really do the whole USB multi-boot thing. All you need is a DOS utility disk. We'll get into that another day, though. So we're going to quick format this into NTFS. And of course, the obligatory warning of this will destroy all of the data on the device. This shouldn't take too long. Of course, the bigger the, diver the, bigger the device, the bigger the drive, the longer this will take. All right, and we're going to go ahead and close out of that, and it goes to the next phase of USB multi-boot. So, uh, Number zero is to actually change, or option zero is to change whether or not you're going to be loading this from a USB stick or a USB hard drive. Notice how in the upper right corner here, it is now USB hard disk, but no, we want USB thumb drive, we want a stick. Okay, so give the Windows XP source path, option one. Now it's already put at CXP SP2, da 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 da. Eh, I've already gone through this a couple of times for uh, a few other machines, but. I'll give you the rundown. All right, so we're going to point it to C, triple E, XP, because I want to get Windows XP on my triple E. Yay for censorship. What this box that's blurred out that you can't see, uh, basically it is the um, automatic uh, attended options. It actually has the owner name, organization, product key, computer name, admin password, time zone, work group, uh, first user name of the machine, and whether or not it uses semi-unattended un or full unattended. There's a yes, no, or cancel. Hit yes for full attended, no for semi unattended, and cancel if you do not want to change anything. If you do want to change any of this data, you hit the E option. Under here, you see E, edit user data setup. Choose this and it will ask you a series of questions, which I have just, uh, just stated username, serial number, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so now we need to go to option two give USB drive a target. Where is it going? So we are putting this on my F drive. So we click our F drive. Now, 
If you actually wanted to add USB content, now the USB multiboot allows you to uh, add content of images, installation packages, etc., etc. It also allows you to uh, install things to the OEM directory, such as extended drivers. The B underscore INI folder, which I'll explain this in a moment, is different boot parameters. This is quite literally a boot.ini that you'd typically find in Windows XP. This would be used for the changing the variables of how your host handles USB drives themselves. Of course, we have one for Windows 2000, sorry, Windows 2003, a multi-boot, meaning you have multiple boot images. Let's say you wanted to put a Windows XP Service Patch 2 uh, uh, in installation, uh, BART PE, and a custom pre-boot environment all on one. This will allow you to do all of those. We have uh, Partition 2 bootloader, Windows NT 5.1, and Windows XP setup, which we'll be using. So we're going to go back to this, and uh, we're actually going to hit B and select the proper. Let's drag this down here. We're going to select Windows XP setup boot.ini because this is Windows XP. Now select WinNT.sif. .sif files are uh, predefined configurations for uh, your product ID, your, your product serial number, your username, you know, all the settings that it just. I just censor it out because I don't want you having. But if you need to change that, so be it. All right, so once all of that's prepped up and you're ready to go, okay, I mean, of course, the, the SIF uh, information, the same stuff that you'd go through as you were setting up Windows, you know, time, date, location, all that crap. But anyway, once you get all that set up, we're going to hit the, uh, option three. And this is actually going to start uh, the process. It's going to make, it's going to measure some free space, copy some bootloaders, do some magic, copy some files, etc, etc. Now, uh, once this actually gets going, it's going to take a little while, but it's going to actually ask you, once all of this is done, a couple of questions, which we'll get to once it actually pops up. Now, depending on the speed of your actual drive, if this is USB 1.1, uh, yeah, you'll, I'll see you in the, the next coming of Christ. It'll take you forever in a day. Okay, so here's the first dialog box that we've come across. It's asking, do you want to copy the XP plus extra information, like the extra packages and whatnot, from the sources to your USB drive, or do you only want to copy the extra sources, meaning have you changed some kind of extra sources and you do not want to overwrite your current uh, you know, Windows XP or preboot environment installation off of this drive? Clicking yes will wipe everything off the drive and install it as it is. So that's what we want to do. The drive is already formatted. We're going to hit yes. And uh, this is going to about take about 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on how full your Windows XP or how bloated it is. So uh, we're just going to cut frame and uh, leave all the boring stuff out. All right, this question at the end that's asking uh, file copy to the USB drive is ready. Okay, success. Now this yes or no dialog box is asking us whether or not your device is going to be referring to your USB thumb drive as a thumb drive or is it going to be referring it to as an actual hard drive. Now if your drive, if, now you can check this in the BIOS, we'll do this in a minute on my Triple E. Uh, when you plug in the USB thumb drive in, does it actually say USB thumb drive? If that is the case, click yes. If it doesn't, and it actually comes up as a USB hard drive, then click no. Okay, so I know it sounds a little complicated, but okay. Just try one or the other if it doesn't work. Now, uh, notice at the screen right now it says press any key to continue, but if you look down here, it's still going to access my thumb drive. Now, this access on the thumb drive will actually blink on and off a little bit for the next uh, 45 seconds, maybe up to three minutes, depending if you're on USB 1.1. Either way, don't just pull the stick out and get too anxious. Wait it out. Man, if you do not have an LED indicator for the, the right indicator on your thumb drive, uh, you know what? Go for a drink. Come back in about five minutes. So um, after this, you're pretty much done. Uh, there's not much more to this. Uh, you're going to fuck up the first couple of times, guaranteed. It took me a few uh, tries before I actually got the, uh, the boot parameters correct on my actual devices. Just be patient, give it a shot, give it a go. Uh, don't know if I mentioned this, but you can also use this in conjunction with NLite. Any Windows XP install will work, or Windows, uh, Windows NT-based uh, preboot environment. All right, so you know what? 
you know me. I have a no bullshit policy on the show, so I'm gonna go and uh, one, once this is done, I'm gonna while this is doing this, I'm gonna actually cut frame. I'm gonna go and point this at my my TV. I'm gonna take the Triple uh, E, hook it up, and we'll do a piracy style uh, screener. Alrighty, got the uh, USB thumb drive plugged into the USB port. Gonna boot up the Triple E real quick, and we're gonna go into the BIOS. All right. And we are going to go into the advanced and check out the IDE configuration. Okay, so we've got the IDE hard drive is installed. We're going to go to the onboard devices, make sure our USB is enabled. And uh, also check your BIOS to see if uh, legacy USB support and, you know, there's some uh, BIOSes have more options when it comes to USB. You really need to poke around. If you don't know what you're doing, just don't save. Just go online, Google, ask questions. Uh, for the EEE, you actually have to go to the... Uh, the OS installation as start, then the boot order, which a lot of people actually completely overlook. First boot device should be removable devices. Second one should actually be a tappy CD-ROM, but I really don't feel like going from CD-ROM. Okay, and third boot device will be our hard drive, and we're going to go to our hard disk drives. Notice how the first drive is labeled as HDD Solid State Media ASUS Fission. The second drive, the second device, is USB, Memorex, travel drive. Now, this is the, uh, in preference to that last question that USB Multiboot asked us, uh, whether or not it's going to be, uh, your USB thumb drive will be detected as a thumb drive or a hard drive. This is, in fact, showing us that it is being detected as a thumb drive. Okay, so we're going to exit and save changes. Not that we saved anything. And I'll just boot up into the bootloader real quick. Start, start booting off the USB thumb drive, press escape to boot. USB thumb drive blinking away as it's being accessed. This will take a little while. Now, of course, this is not as fast as an optical drive uh, if it was physically tied into the IDE bus or serial ATA, either way. Okay, so uh, we have step one, begin text mode setup of Windows XP. Never unplug the USB drive until a logon. That is very good information. That is a very good tip. Do not unplug this USB drive even if you shut your computer down and turn it back on. Just don't. Just leave it in. Uh, then the second step and third step will be to continue with the graphical user environment mode, but you're going to start with step one, and you'll notice that it'll just load into the typical shameless Windows XP blue screen, blue loading screen. And this will probably take me about three hours to complete. It's not the fastest setup in the world, but proof of concept. You can, in fact, install and run Windows XP and Windows NT preboot environments and installations from a USB thumb drive. For more information, uh, go to the forums in the show notes for this segment, and I will put some links and information pertaining some help and advice and all that other jazz. Now. This is probably going to take me about three hours, so you go fuck off and enjoy the rest of the episode while I suffer. Android FTP is a simple, basic, easy-to-use uh, FTP client for the Android operating system. Uh, it's pretty easy to set up. Just open it up, click Edit, type in the IP address you want to connect to, select the transfer type. You can have uh, FTP... Uh, SSH file transfer protocol or FTP over TLS slash SSL. Uh, select the method you want, type in the port, most of the time that's 21, your username and your password. You can set the directory you want to download it to. Uh, right now I have it just set to root of the SD card. You can save to folders on the phone if you want or onto the SD card. Uh, set in your remote directory and just click save. Now just connect, and as you see, you can see all the files on my FTP server that I just set up. Just select whatever files you want and click download, and it'll download them to whatever directory you want. So that's pretty simple to use. Let's move on to the next program. This next program is called ConnectBot. It's a SSH client for the Android operating system. It's actually one of the most used applications on my phone. Uh, it's really good for anything that you need, but I use it mainly for IRC. Uh, I find it's great 
because you know unlike using a regular IRC client when I'm on the road with this if I hit a dead spot and disconnect I don't miss half the conversation as soon as I hit a uh, get a cell phone signal it reconnects and I can read back on the scroll buffer so it's pretty easy to set up uh, the first thing you want to do is hit menu go to the settings and it's got some settings in there uh, you can select the emulation mode uh, rotation mode you can force it landscape or portrait or have it automatic uh, I normally have my phone on automatic so when I slide out the keyboard it'll rotate the screen for me but being as we're on the emulator we want to keep it in portrait mode otherwise I have to go fuck with editing and shit and it's just not fun anyway uh, let's see I choose to keep the screen awake when I'm running this program and I keep Wi-Fi alive most of the time when I use this I'm actually plugged into power so it doesn't really matter anyway but at least this way it stays connected for you when I hit the back arrow key you're just gonna enter in your your username at host where you connect to I already have it entered in of course I'm gonna censor that and it attempts to log on and it asks for your password. Enter your password, hit enter, and it connects to your shell. Let's see. Um, And I'm on IRC again through my cell, through a shell now, instead of through the actual uh, cell phone connection. So I hope you find this useful, and there's many more apps to come. If you're looking for a simple, basic, easy to use port scanner for the Android phone, Port Scandroid will do the job. Uh, like I said, it's basic, it's simple. Uh, it is kind of slow though, so. I'll have to time lapse this to show the results, but uh, it's not too bad, so give it a try. Android IRC. Uh, this is an IRC client, one of many IRC clients for Android phones. Uh, it's still in beta, they're still working on it. Uh, it seems to be okay for me so far. Uh, first thing you want to do is click, sorry, I jumped the gun there, click the options and go to server settings type in the server that you want uh, your options use SSL, set in your choices for names username channels you want to auto join and same as your regular IRC client whatever and you know, just go to okay it's already connected but as you can see we're in the channel and we're on IRC so it's simple to use I'll probably demonstrate a couple other IRC clients right now this only supports I believe one channel at a time and it only supports one server but they're going to be uh, doing upgrades to it and hopefully soon it'll do multi-server and multi Wi-Fi scan is the first Wi-Fi scanner that was made for the G1 cell phone or should I say for the Android operating system uh, it's pretty simple. It does its job, but it's kind of buggy. As you can see right now, it's listing all the access points in the area and tagging the GPS locations for each of them. If you hit the menu button, there's an option down here to save to a KML file, and you can take it home and view all the access points in uh, Google Earth. Uh, over here, there's a button you can hit to show on the map and it will eventually bring up a map and show where the access points are located at. Like I said, this is the first Wi-Fi scanner that was designed for the Android operating system and it is quite buggy. It takes a while to run and I'm probably going to have to end up cutting out a bit of footage to uh, show when things load. Okay, here it goes. It loads up for us. But as you see, it's plotting the access points out on the map. Uh, we can zoom in and see a little bit clearer. Sorry for the shaky image. I'm trying to record in a moving car. Uh, yeah, it's trying to crash. So, like I said, 
Uh, give it a try. There's another Wi-Fi scanner that I'm going to show next that I use that I like a lot better than this one. This next application is called Wi-Fi Recorder. It's a lot like Wi-Fi Scan except it works and it doesn't lag as much or crash. As you can see, it's showing us driving down the road and it's pinpointing the Wi-Fi access points on the fly. And it's doing it actually really accurately and really smooth. Uh, there's some options in here. If you press the menu button, you can uh, zoom in on the map. You can, uh, let's bring up a network list. Now it actually brings up just the different networks. It tells, it tells you if they're secure. Uh, you can zoom in and get a little bit of information on the different networks. Uh, if we go back to the map, we also have the option to uh, save. What files does it save? Who's to save or not? Yeah. So it'll, it'll save the actual scan to your SD card. And when you get home, you can punch it in with your favorite application, whether it be uh, Google Earth or GPS Visualizer or whatever application you want, and you can see where all the access points you scanned were at. So give this application a try and let us know what you think. I know I enjoy it a lot. Today we're going to talk about standing waves and what they mean to you. Standing waves are a wave in a media be it a string in the case of a guitar or a coax cable in the case of a radio system they are a wave that are that is made up of two components in this particular graphic that you're seeing one of those components is the blue component that's moving to the right the other component is the red component that's moving to the left in the case of a guitar the blue component runs down reaches the end of the string for the guitar is reflected back and comes back as the red component that runs to the other end of the string then gets reflected back as the blue component and comes back and then you have the where they overlap when you combine those two you get the black string the black line the black wave that you see in the animation and in the case of a guitar standing waves are great that's what we want. We want that sound, that vibration. We need that standing wave to get out of the guitar what it is that we want. Whenever you're talking about radios, we want the opposite. We don't want a standing wave. Because standing wave means the 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 more the higher the standing wave ratio, the more power that is trapped in the media that is between point A and point B or the radio and the antenna in this case would be the coax cable. A high standing wave is a bad thing when it comes to an antenna setup. If you think of this animation as a coax cable and you think of off the left hand side there is a radio, off the right hand side there is an antenna, and we are pushing power, that blue wave, we are pushing that blue wave's power down that coax cable. It's reaching the antenna, and instead of going out the antenna, instead of going out into the air, something's happening to it, and it's reflecting back, and it's coming back to us, back towards the radio, as the red wave. This is very bad. This is not what we want. So the standing wave ratio is a measure of how efficient your antennas are it lets you know how much power you have being reflected back from the antenna point back towards your radio. The more power that you have reflected back towards your radio, the less power leaves the antenna the way you want and radiates into the air. So in the case of amateur radio, commercial radio, anything involving radio, the standing wave ratio is very important to us. Okay, what you see here is the face of an analog SWR meter the meter, the, you see the two needles, the orange needles down there at the bottom. The left hand needle is going to measure forward power. The right hand needle is going to measure reflected power. The two of them together, where they cross, is going to give us the standing wave ratio for the antenna that we are currently using. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the antenna I am currently using is a mag mount mobile antenna that is not tuned very well. It's alright, but it's not great. So here we go. 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shoot some power down it. I've already identified with my call sign and let them know that I am doing antenna testing. So uh, that part's out of the way. Here we go. Okay. Now what you just saw was about 0.6 on the reflected and about run it again here right at seven give or take on the forward power now this is measured in watts so I'm currently pushing about seven watts out and I'm getting about 0.6 of those watts reflected back at my radio and they cross at about an SWR of 1.7, somewhere in that 1.7 range, 1.7, 1.8. That's really not a good SWR, but it's not a horrible SWR. It could be a whole lot worse. And the antenna works decently well for what I need to use it for. So, all in all, it's not too bad. But as you can see, we have a measurement here, and we are measuring the forward power on the left hand side the reflected power on the right and whenever I key it up you can see that I'm that there's a lot more forward power than there is reflected power so that means that power is going somewhere and the somewhere is out being radiated from the antenna okay here is the formula that can be used to calculate the standing wave ratio and it's pretty straightforward P sub F is your forward power in watts. That's how much you're pushing from your transmitter. Whenever you key down your radio, that's how much it's, your radio is putting out. P sub R is how much is being reflected back from the other end of the coax. That's what, you know, you push that signal down and you'll have a certain amount of it come back, just like we saw on the little analog meter. That's what that is a measure of. So let's, let's do a couple here. Let's, let's start out, let's assume best case scenario. Let's assume 100 percent of the power we push down that coax is radiating out the antenna. Now this is never going to happen. This is an ideal case but it is never going to happen in the real world. There will always be losses. There will always be very small reflections. You can't get away from it. Every junction that you have, every connector that you have is going to be a spot that reflects a small amount back or absorbs a small amount or something. But We'll just go with the math for an ideal case. I pick 16 watts because that's going to make the math really easy. So we're pushing 16 watts from our radio. We're getting nothing back in a reflection. So let's go ahead and plug those into the formula. Do a little bit of simplification. And it all boils down to a standing wave ratio of 1. That is a perfect standing wave ratio in terms of radio stuff. Whenever you're dealing with radios, a standing wave ratio of one is perfect. That means that everything you're shooting down is radiating somewhere out of that antenna. That's what we want. Again, that's an ideal case. You're never going to see that in the real world. Let's go with an absolute worst case that you actually can almost see in the real world. You're not going to see it exactly, but you're going to see it really close in the real world if you don't hook an antenna to your radio and you try to keep your radio up. In this case, we're shooting 16 watts down. We're getting 16 watts back. Plug those into the formula, and you are left with... Now, yes, technically, you can't have 8 over 0. That is meaningless the limit as that lower number, as that denominator, approaches zero is infinity. That's what we mean by this. But the gist of it is the standing wave ratio that you have in this case of 100% of, of that power being reflected back at you is infinity. It is the highest possible standing wave ratio that you can do in, unless you, there is something else acting upon the system. So as long as there is only one transmission source in the system. This is a worst case scenario. Now you can actually see this if you take and just have your radio and don't actually have an antenna attached to it. 
or a terminator or a or anything if you don't have any kind of a dummy load or terminator or or <clears throat> or antenna hooked to your radio and you key it up this is what you're doing what that means is that all the power coming out of your finals in your radio is reflecting off the connector or off the coax or whatever is on the back of your radio and going right back at the finals in your radio it is entirely possible for you to fry your radio if you do this because those finals may not be able to handle the power let's go ahead and jump over to what we saw whenever we were using the analog meter now the analog meter we were getting seven watts out of that radio we were seeing 0.6 watts reflecting back at us and let's go ahead and plug those in I'm not gonna do the 7 watts is an estimate, the 0.6 watts is an estimate, so I'm going to go ahead and do the math, assuming that, that they are estimates. And plugging those through the calculations, simplifying the fraction that we've got, we find a standing wave ratio of 1.82. Now that's really close to what we saw on the meter, that's probably actually what the meter was reading was about the 1.8 range, because it was a little higher than 1.7. So the antenna that I have, with the radio that I have, on the frequency that I was using, I was getting a standing wave ratio of 1.82. And that 1.82 tells me that my 7 watts that I'm pushing out, I'm getting 0.6 of those watts back. The downside is I'm getting some of that power back. But you're always going to get some of that power back. The upside is that it means that there are 6.4 watts that were radiating out of my antenna. So I'm pushing 7 watts down the cable, and 6.4 watts are radiating out of my antenna. So that's not horrible. That's still a decent amount of power. And that actually, that antenna works pretty good so far, knock on wood. I haven't had any trouble with it, and the radio, I've not had any difficulty communicating with anybody I want to communicate with. But I hope after this that you guys get some kind of an understanding of what standing wave ratio is, what standing wave ratio means. The simplest term, standing wave ratio, is a measure of antenna efficiency. Now, that's not always true. You can actually get a standing wave ratio of one or close to one. You won't get exactly one, but you can get really close to one by just putting a dummy load on your, on your radio. A dummy load is just a resistor. That's all it is but it means that instead of that power, that, that wattage that you're pushing down radiating out the antenna and into the air, it's turning, being turned into heat through the resistance of the dummy load. So while your radio is pushing 7 watts down and getting almost nothing as a return, you're not actually transmitting anything to the world because it's all being eaten by the heat. The power has to go somewhere. But for the most part, you can ignore the resistance whenever you're doing these calculations unless you're dealing with really really thin coax and really really high frequency and then the resistance just eats it up uh, or if you're dealing with uh, it, it really depends on what you're dealing with but for the most part you could ignore the resistive aspect of it and just focus on the reflection from the antenna because the antenna is not in tune and use these numbers, use a, an SWR meter, and calculate how efficient, how tuned your antenna is for the frequency that you want to run on. The Internet in the year 2009, we send emails, make calls over the internet, and discuss topics we take an interest in. Even our banking is going virtual. But what we take for granted today was only a vague idea 50 years ago. In order to understand how we got this far, let's go back to 1957, when everything began. Before 1957, computers only worked on one task at a time. This is called batch processing. Of course, this was quite ineffective. With computers getting bigger and bigger, they had to be stored in special cooled rooms. But then, the developers couldn't work directly on the computers anymore. Specialists had to be called in to connect them. 
Programming at that time meant a lot of manual work and the indirect connection to the computers led to a lot of bugs, wasting time and fraying the developers' nerves. The year 1957 marked a big change. A remote connection had to be installed so that the developers could work directly on the computers. At the same time, the idea of time sharing came up. This is the first concept in computer technology to share the processing power of one computer with multiple users. On October 4th in 1957, during the Cold War, the first unmanned satellite Sputnik 1 was sent into orbit by the Soviet Union. The fear of a missile gap emerged. In order to secure America's lead in technology, the U.S. founded the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in February 1958. At that time, knowledge was only transferred by people. The DARPA planned a large-scale computer network in order to accelerate knowledge transfer and avoid the doubling up of already existing research. This network would become the ARPANET. Furthermore, three other concepts were to be developed, which are fundamental for the history of the Internet. The concept of a military network by the RAND Corporation in America. The commercial network of the National Physical Laboratory in England. And the scientific network, Cyclades, in France. The scientific, military and commercial approaches of these concepts are the foundations for our modern Internet. Let's begin with the ARPANET, the most familiar of these networks. Its development began in 1966. Universities were generally quite cautious about sharing their computers. Therefore, small computers were put in front of the mainframe. This computer, the Interface Message Processor, took over control of the network activities, while the mainframe was only in charge of the initialization of programs and data files. At the same time, the IMP also served as interface for the mainframe. Since only the IMPs were interconnected in a network, this was also called IMP subnet. For the first connections between the computers, the Network Working Group developed the Network Control Protocol. Later on, the NCP was replaced by the more efficient Transmission Control Protocol. The specific feature of the TCP is the verification of the file transfer. Let's take a short detour to England. Since the NPL network was designed on a commercial basis, a lot of users and file transfer were expected. In order to avoid congestion of the lines, the sent files were divided into smaller packets, which were put together again at the receiver. Packet switching was born. In 1962, American ferret aircraft discovered middle- and long-range missiles in Cuba, which were able to reach the United States. This stoked fear of an atomic conflict. At that time, information systems had a centralized network architecture. To avoid breakdown during an attack, a decentralized network architecture had to be developed, which, in case of loss of a node, would still be operative. Communication still used to work through radio waves. That would have caused problems in case of an atomic attack. The ionosphere would be affected and the long wave radio waves wouldn't work anymore. Therefore, they had to use direct waves, which, however, don't have a long range. A better solution was the model of a distributed network. Thus, long distances could be covered with a minimum of interference. Another milestone followed with the development of the French network Cyclades. Since Cyclades had a far smaller budget than ARPANET, and thus also fewer nodes, the focus was laid on the communication with other networks. In this way, the term Internet was born. Moreover, Cyclades' concept went further than ARPA's and the MPLs. During communication between sender and receiver, the computers were not to intervene anymore, but simply serve as a transfer node. Suclade's protocol went through all machines using a physical layer that was implemented into the hardware, providing a direct connection with the receiver, an end-to-end -end structure. 
Inspired by the Suclades network and driven by the incompatibility between the networks, their connection gained in importance everywhere. The phone companies developed the X.25 protocol, which enabled communication through their servers, in exchange for a monthly basic charge, of course. DARPA's transmission control protocol was to connect the computers through gateways. And the International Organization for Standardization designed the OSI reference model. The innovation of OSI was the attempt to standardize the network from its ends and the channel's division into separate layers. Finally, the TCP assimilated the preferences of the OSI reference model and gave way to the TCP IP protocol, a standard which guaranteed compatibility between networks and finally merged them, creating the Internet. By February the 28th, 1990, the ARPANET hardware was removed, but the Internet was up and running.